Welcome everyone to the second meeting of the Education and Skills Committee. Can I please remind everyone to present to turn off the mobile phones as they can interfere with the sound system. Uh, agenda item one is a declaration of interest. Can I uh, ask the members who were not present for the first committee meeting to declare any interests that they have that are relevant to the work of the committee? And I invite Liz Smith. Yes, can I declare that I am a member of the General Teaching Council for Scotland and that I am uh, a member of the Board of Governors of two schools, George Watson's College and St Mary's School in Melrose. Ross? Thank you. Tavish? Uh, no relevant uh, interest can be other than being a parent of children at various stages through education, which makes me very relevant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who could argue with that? Thank you very much. Uh, item two, the next item of business is to consider taking item four in private. Are we agreed? Thank you. And agenda item three is... Uh, the Scottish Government's priorities and I, I welcome to the committee John Swinney who's uh, attending in his capacity as Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills. I also welcome Paul Johnson, Director General for Learning and Justice and Dr Bill Maxwell, the uh, Chief Executive of Education Scotland. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the letter of the 22nd of June which members have with the papers. I understand Cabinet Secretary you'd like to make an opening statement. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Kavina, and uh, I welcome the opportunity to meet with the committee and to discuss issues relevant to my portfolio and look forward to doing that over the course of this parliamentary term. As the First Minister has made clear, education is the defining mission of this government. There can be no greater responsibility than working to improve the life chances of our children. The government's commitment to education underpins our three top priorities of delivering sustainable economic growth, public sector reform and addressing the inequality that exists within our society. The primary challenge we are faced with in our education system is the closing of the attainment gap, the gap between the attainment of young people from the most and the least disadvantaged areas. I am determined to ensure that every child has the same opportunity to succeed in Scotland. And my priorities will range across three particular areas. Firstly, to ensure that our children and young people get the best start in life. I will focus on transforming early learning and childcare with a doubling of provision the deployment of flexibility to help parents, uh, particularly mothers, to return to work, and an insistence of educational input to close the attainment gap before it begins to have a profound impact. Secondly, by empowering teachers, parents and communities, reducing workload, ensuring that funding reaches schools to meet the needs uh, of local areas and to focus on what works in the process of strengthening our school system. We will be relentless in our efforts to close the attainment gap and raise standards for all, um, and that underpins the approach of the pursuit of ex equity and excellence for all within our society. And thirdly, by widening opportunities to access higher, further and vocational education, um, the government uh, will work to ensure that every child has the, the same chance to progress through breaking down the barriers that prevent young people from deprived backgrounds from progressing to the same levels as their more affluent peers reach. Um, yesterday, I announced the delivery plan to Parliament, which sets out a range of tangible steps to make significant progress in closing the attainment gap, in tackling the issue of uh, workload within the education system, and in undertaking the reform measures that the Government has set out. Uh, there is a range of strong performance already within our education system. Um, we have seen uh, that uh, assessed and validated by the OECD in their uh, report on Scottish education. And we can see also from the statistical analysis improvements in the attainment and the performance of young people. Um, the most recent statistics in relation to the uh, detail and positive destinations indicated that more than six in ten young people had achieved a qualification at higher level or above, uh, reflecting the hard work, commitment and dedication of young people, um, schools, teachers and those who supported them through school. Um, these are the priorities that the government will focus on and will take them forward to ensure that they are uh, addressed as part of the, uh, the work that the government takes forward to, to deliver our priorities on education. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Can I just ask everybody to make sure that their phones are off, please? Thank you very much. Uh, OK, before we start on, uh, we have a, a, a number of groups of questions that we'd like to ask. I'd like to start off by asking uh, a couple of questions based around last Thursday's European referendum result. Could, since the vote on Thursday, universities across Scotland have identified concerns in terms of EU research funding and the mobility of staff and students. Has the Scottish Government had time to quantify the effects of Brexit on higher education institutions in Scotland? 
And how will the Scottish Government ensure that the sector's interests are promoted during Brexit negotiations? This question, Kavir, obviously uh, involves us considering a, a, a significant amount of uncertainty about what is actually going to emerge as a final outcome. So therefore, I think the importance is that we concentrate on reinforcing the, uh, the, the messages about stability within the system. If I take, for example, the issue of um, undergraduate admission to universities, and there will be students from EU countries that um, will be uh, proposing or planning uh, to come to Scotland uh, just in a few months' time. And we are working with University Scotland, and the universities are doing a significant amount of this work themselves, but the government is working with them to reinforce this, um, to essentially issue a message that absolutely nothing will change for the young people who are proposing to, to come to Scottish universities in uh, the autumn. And I think it's important that we issue those messages of stability and continuity um, because they reflect the reality. There will be, you know, there will be no impact on uh, the individuals who uh, take those decisions. I think in relation to the longer term, uh, I think the question that you raise, particularly convener, about um, research funding is a very important point because there will be transnational projects in which academics from Scotland are involved in participating and they will have tremendous expertise and they will have European counterparts who will be anxious to have their expertise built into these transnational projects. Um, I think it's an important point that we as a government need to reinforce as part of our input into the discussions that the First Minister, for example, is taking forward in Brussels today or that she will input into the discussions with the United Kingdom government along with other devolved administrations to make sure that the very important perspectives of the higher education sector, um, both in relation to the recruitment of students and in the participation in transnational research programmes, um, are adequately and fully borne in mind in the design of what relationships exist for um, the United Kingdom with the European Union as a consequence of the referendum result. Thank you very much for that. Can I ask that if there are any material changes that uh, the committee is made aware of? I certainly will uh, obviously advise, I intend to um, advise the committee of um, uh, all of the developments that I think are relevant across the portfolio on an ongoing basis. Um, I will uh, aim to do that as assiduously as I possibly can do. And obviously I recognise the significance of this particular issue and I was with the Vice Chancellor of the University of Edinburgh last night, and um, you know, we discussed this particular issue. It's a, a very significant issue for the University of Edinburgh, as it is for all of our universities, and uh, we will be involved in very active dialogue with the university community uh, around this point. Thank you. Uh, I have another question on skills. What level of EU funding do skills programmes in Scotland receive, and how will the challenge of developing an agile and skilled workforce be affected by this Brexit? The main channel for um, skills funding from the European Union is um, essentially taken forward through measures around the, the European programmes, European Social Fund programmes, and um, we, we obviously, uh, the, the, there's a kind of wide application of those within the sector um, with a range of different providers involved. Um, I don't have a, a specific quantification of that uh, in front of me today, convener, but I'm certainly happy to write to the committee with a quantification of the, 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 the current position in that respect. And obviously, the, um, the answer I gave you to, my, to your first question um, reflects the fact that we're not absolutely clear as to what shape the arrangements will take on an ongoing basis, and it will be important that we reflect that in, uh, in, in the analysis that we undertake in due course. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to the other themes, the other groups. Can I ask Liz Smith to... Madam Secretary, um, in, in an answer you gave me on the uh, 24th of May uh, when I'd asked about uh, what criteria you will use to measure uh, whether attainment has actually improved, uh, you gave me an interesting answer when you said that you'll gather and analyse a range of data and evidence. Could I just tease this out a little bit about um, how you will determine whether or not improvement is being made in attainment. And I think that, that is very much about the definition of the gap 
uh, to which we all refer uh, very regularly. Could you actually just set out your views on this and what is the gap in terms of its definition and how will you measure whether there has actually been an improvement? I think it's important, first of all, to say that um, the gap in attainment is, um, is something that the government wants to assess and address at various stages in the educational journey of a young person. So if I, if I put that into some context, I was at, asked in a radio interview a couple of weeks ago on the issue of widening access to higher education. Um, was that the gap that I was worried about? And uh, my answer was that if we left it till that point, we were missing a massive opportunity to remedy the issues that may, may confront young people. So the gap that exists, I think, must be assessed at various stages in the educational journey of young people. So, for example, the vocabulary gap between uh, amongst children entering primary one can be really quite significant. It can be up to what's well, assessed to be as much as 13 months. Well, we have to be... That is, a, that is a gap if we do not endeavour to close that at the age of five when young people enter primary education, then we will be essentially setting that young person on a journey which will be ever more difficult to close that gap. So I, I don't view the, the attainment gap as one moment in time. I view that as, 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 as a gap that has to be assessed at various stages in the, in the, the life of a young person. In relation to the data point, we will be publishing um, a, a report consistent with the National Improvement Framework, which will be drawn together the available data that we have just now. But I think Liz Smith is conversant with all of the detail to know that we don't believe that data to be sufficiently clear and firm for us to be able at this stage to be um, definitive about what we We'll, do our, we'll gather the information to the best of our ability to define what we consider the gaps to be, but we don't, at this stage, believe the data is available to enable us to do that conclusively. That is why we believe we have to move to the position of having standardised assessment to then inform teacher judgment about the performance of young people. So the, the report that we produce um, in the autumn... Um, will essentially be um, the, the, the best utilisation of the available data we have just now in advance of the um, information being pre uh, emerging from the use of standardised assessment. Could I just follow up on that? I mean, we were told at a previous committee uh, in the last session of Parliament uh, by ADES that they actually felt largely the data was available but perhaps it wasn't presented in a way that um, was easy enough to interpret and that parents could readily understand. Is the Scottish Government looking for more data or is it looking to have a better interpretation of the data that already exists? Yeah, I, I, well, I, the, first, the first point is that I wouldn't share the view that you have heard from ADES about the quality of the data. Uh, I, I, for example, um, I, I, we, we do not have comparable data authority by authority. So we have data within authorities, yes, and in most authorities. Is that data comparable? I don't consider it to be directly comparable, which is why I answered the first question that Elizabeth asked me in the way that I did, that we will be using our best endeavours to use the data that's currently available to provide that comparative picture. But we don't believe it is sufficiently authoritative to enable us to do that, which is why we need to move to standardised assessment. Could I just finish my uh, could, question? Could I, could I, could I add one, 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 one additional point to that, which is about, um, and this is relevant because of the signal that might be interpreted from, from how I'm answering this, I want to have, I, I don't want to create a further cottage industry of data. Where there is data being collected but it's not com comparable, I want to replace that data with comparable comparable data. So this is not my attempt to create another cottage industry of bureaucracy and data. It is my attempt to try to get the data that will actually enable us to undertake the type of analysis that will, uh, first of all, assess the scale of the gap and then measure the effectiveness of the interventions that are deployed to try to close that gap over time. Okay. Could I just finish on the point? I mean, if there are several measures uh, which you've identified at different stages in the child's progression, 
uh, at the end of, let's say, four years where you have to make a judgment as to whether attainment has improved or not, will there be any key indicators that you're looking for to say that Scotland is beginning to narrow the gap? Essentially, the, 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 the journey will be um, assessed by the performance of young people in reaching the levels identified within Curriculum for Excellence. That will be, that will be the, the, the measure. But obviously, at each of those levels, we will have, at year one, a size of a gap identified. At year two, we will be able to revisit that situation to determine what has been the performance. So on an ongoing basis, it won't be a case of just leaving it all for a four-year period. We'll be looking at that data on a regular basis to determine what is the effect of the measures that we are taking to try to close the attainment gap on an ongoing basis. Okay, thank you. Jen? Wiener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, in terms of the data Liz Smith alluded to in her question, I'm also interested specifically in what type of data we're talking about at the moment. I appreciate you might not be able to quantify that at this stage. Um, and secondly, will teaching staff be trained in terms of how to interpret that data so that they can then uh, use it to affect improvements in terms of learning and teaching and therefore um, allowing them to obviously contribute to closing the attainment gap? Yes, that, that, that will be the case. So obviously, the, the, um, the, the, the ultimate um, product of, um, uh, the, 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 of, the, of the information that fuels our, um, the, the national um, improvement framework is, relies on teacher judgment being informed by standardised assessment. So ultimately, it will be teacher judgment that is the, the measure of, um, uh, of performance, but it will be informed by standardised assessments. And what, uh, so of course the, the, it will be essential that uh, the teaching profession are adequately equipped to, and supported uh, to handle uh, that particular task and to make sure that we have um, a comparative um, uh, presentation of the information and a comparative understanding of the information. But then also that we are using measures such as the National Improvement Hub to share good practice within the teaching profession to enable teachers to identify where um, there is a gap in attainment that we are able to, that, that teachers are able to access the necessary resources to enable them to try to address those issues um, and to improve performance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So can I just ask a, a, a supplementary on that? On, on the 26th of May, <clears throat> you stated that, um, that you'd met with the Chief Examiner of Scotland, uh, 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 following on from the, the report on the Working Group and Assessment, um, where she had stated that reduction uh, and the further burden of, uh, from assessment and teachment wouldn't be possible without compromising you know, quality and, and standards. And I, I mean, I recognise there's a real tension here between collecting the data and also the, the, the will to reduce teacher workload. I just wanted to ask whether or not there's been a, any sort of development in your assessment. Is, is this represent a change in your assessment of that? And, and, and kind of what's your response to that? We, we, uh, essentially, we, we, these are two different topics in, 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 my, in my view of, the, of, the, of the, the general issue around standardised assessment and the attainment gap on the specific point that Mr Johnson asked me about, about the, um, the workload in the senior phase of, 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 of education, which is, was the subject of my discussions with the, um, the chief examiner and um, uh, as a matter of interest to the committee, my second meeting with the chief examiner is this afternoon to assess uh, progress. The point which I accepted um, in the, the, the comments to which Mr Johnson refers is the argument which was essentially marshalled for me by the Assessment and Qualifications Working Group that in 2016-17 um, if there was to be a change to the unit assessments the view of the Chief Examiner and this was accepted by the Assessment and Qualifications Group would it be difficult on that model to certificate qualifications and, and I judged on, on that basis, that would, be, that would be a risk I couldn't uh, contemplate. Does that mean that's the case for all time? No, it doesn't, um, because I think there are measures that can be taken 
to reduce the assessment workload, um, not just on teachers, I have to say the assessment work workload, assessment burden on young people into the bargain, which is a matter of mm -hmm. some concern to me as well. So um, uh, for 16-17, for that would be my view, but it's not my view for all time. Okay, thank you. You, you spoke um, at the beginning about improvements in attainment in general terms, which is both a credit to the children, their families and to, and to school staff. Have you a sense, though, or have you looked at the attainment improvements within the most deprived communities? Because as a far example in health, we know that the health of the nation has improved, but has remained stubbornly problematic for particular groups. And because it seems to me that you can, the danger with having data it describes a picture and then says what teachers need to do for individual young people, but doesn't then, or does it mean that you then gives you the information to target resources and policy developments to actually address the inequalities within the system? That is, if there are patterns, it's not just about individual child's ability to progress, but there, there are barriers to particular groups of young people, for example, children with disabilities or who have special needs, are, are, they, are they progressing or are, are the attainment levels different? And I suppose I'm just interested if you've looked at that. Uh, the, the answer to the question is yes. And, um, the, the, and it is important. I suppose it also follows on from my answer to, to Liz Smith's question. It is very important that we look um, not just at the age stage of attainment, but of the detail within age stages based on socioeconomic background and also about other factors such as um, uh, the issues of disability or additional support needs. Um, because ultimately, if I, if I take a step back from all of this uh, to answer John Lamont's question, what is driving this agenda must be the fulfilment of the government's commitment to get it right for every child. So if that, if that is genuinely what is the driver of educational policy, <clears throat> which for me is the case, then we have to make sure that we fulfil that in terms of the achievements that are made uh, for young people. So over so different stages, the data will be available, which um, can allow us to examine, for example, what, um, what level of qualifications are achieved by individuals uh, given their socioeconomic background. Um, so it will tell us a picture of um, what is the achievement that emerges um, at the later stages of the educational journey. Um, but the, the more general points that I expressed in my answer to Liz Smith about identifying what is the pattern of the attainment gap in the earlier stages of education is less clear for us to see at this stage. Um, so we can see it at the, the later stage in terms of qualifications achieved as a measure of the closing of the gap but we need to see that more deeply across the educational Slight, journey. With respect, a slightly different point, which is when we say attainment in general terms has improved and they have more qualifications, has that level of improvement been the same across groups or is it, is it different? Because that would then tell you that there is, you know, sim simply improving the lot of everyone does not necessarily mean you close the gap. No, and right. I think, and particularly importantly, is that actually, and it's why when we'll talk about this later, obviously around standardised testing and so on, there's an important discussion to be had about whether children coming from the same general backgrounds achieve differently in different schools. And we, you know, we saw that in Glasgow, and there was amazing interventions made to make sure that actually individual schools, it wasn't about the individual school, there was a general drive. Um, and I think you know, that that's part of it. But if there is something else there, I don't think data and assessing individual tests really deals with that because it isn't about whether the teacher understands properly what level that child has reached. It is something quite different. It's putting education in in a broader context. And I wonder whether there are figures which look at, is there the same pattern as in health inequalities where overall health is improved, but health inequalities remain stubbornly problematic for us? Okay, um, if I can... I, 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 Essentially, I agree with John Lamont's analysis there, and, that, and that's, you know, I'm, I'm trying to bring this to this area of policy because I think that what John Lamont has said there 
illustrates the nature of the challenge that we have to address and overcome. In terms of some data on this, um, the, the, there's been the gap between our 20% most and least deprived pupils achieving um, at least SQF level 5 has reduced from 36.8 percentage points in 2007-8 to 20.9 percentage points. So, the, the, so in, in directly on the point that John Lamont has raised, there has been an improvement over time. Um, there has been, uh, so, 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 so that, that's one illustration of the gap. Another, another illustration of the gap um, is that um, school leavers from our 10% least deprived communities are around twice as likely as those from the 10 most deprived uh, communities to, to achieve at least one qualification at higher or above. But that's a significant improvement on the position in 2007-8 when they were four times likely to do so. So again, at higher level, um, the gap um, has narrowed. So th there is improvement there. So I think, I think, oh, I think that if I could express it this way, it will not be acceptable for me just to improve attainment in general in Scotland, because that may well just entrench the gap that already exists. So we have to improve attainment and narrow the gap at the same time, which is why the strapline of what I talked about yesterday was excellence and equity. Excellence is about improving attainment in general. Equity is about closing the gap. And I want to continually bring the system back to remembering those are the dual challenges that lie at the heart of this agenda. Milton, you've got a short supplementary. Yes. Thanks, Cabinet Secretary. It's actually a follow-up from a question uh, that I asked in the Chamber yesterday, and I appreciated your response, and it's a supplementary uh, to Joanne Lamont, and it relates to the specific group of looked after and accommodated young people. Um, what are the Cabinet Secretary's plans for closing the attainment gap there? Um, and specifically in relation to working with the, um, the various voluntary agencies um, that support these groups of people, such as Who Cares Scotland, uh, Bernardo's, etc. Thanks. I, I think there's a, there's a general point here, which is that um, we, although a lot of the conversation is around education, many of the, the, the measures to address the challenges that Mr McGregor has talked about will come from a much wider set of interventions that are made. So, um, yes, schools and, and uh, teaching profession have a lot to contribute here, but so also um, do, do, does the institutional back, uh, the, the structures of the rest of society, so do the youth organisations. So, you know, one of the early discussions I had, actually, in the, um, the first day I was appointed as the Education Secretary, was with a collection of organisations from the youth work sector, where I, and, and one of the participants in that discussion was also a, a, a high school head teacher who was there to illustrate to me just the ways in which the school was acting, I suppose, as a host for a range of different services in the youth work environment, which were enabling young people to get a wider intervention and support their needs. And of course, that's particularly relevant in relation to uh, looked after children to ensure that we've, we've got a um, a very broad approach to trying to resolve some of the challenges that they will face. So I, th I acknowledge the, um, the need for multidisciplinary work to make sure that the needs of young people are properly addressed. Could it just come in again? Is there, is there anything of the, um, the 100 million um, that's you know, intending to go to head teachers? Would there be a specific remit for head teachers or with this group of young people, or is that more just within the general? Uh, context of the policy? Uh, well, ultimately, that point would be for head teachers to determine what was appropriate in their circumstances. When we had the education summit that a number of members of the committee attended um, a couple of weeks ago, it was in Craig Royston High School in Edinburgh. 
And it was a, a, you know, f a fantastic experience to understand how that school was essentially taken so the, the concept of the school acting as the host is very much in my mind, that the school, yes, it was providing education to young people, but it was also providing a reference point, an anchor point, a connection point. The school was making connections with employers, with youth agencies, and yes, they were delivering a curriculum as well, but they were looking at a much broader range of, uh, of, of, of how they could improve outcomes for young people in a, an area of, of significant economic and social challenge within the city. So, so th th that's, the, that's the model that I think increasingly Scottish education is moving towards, and it's welcome. And obviously the resources that will go directly to head teachers will enable head teachers to make judgments about what is appropriate for the, the young people in their schools. Thank you. Tom? Thank you. Um, can I go back to Liz Smith's correct question right at the start, which is that your government's obviously been in power for nine years. So when I look, read this last night, your del the delivery plan, I expected there to be a definition of closing the gap, of, of what the gap is, and it's not. So I, and you, Cabinet Secretary, this morning you've set out a couple of examples of that, including to Joanne Lamont and Joanne Lamont's previous questions, but how are we able to judge whether we're closing the gap if it's not clearly defined in your delivery plan right in the first paragraph? Because the data doesn't exist to enable me to do that today. And that's the, that's the issue. That's why standardised assessment is required, so that we can have comparable data that gives us a starting point. And then, you know, I appreciate that data doesn't exist today, and you know, so you know, we can uh, debate the, the whys and wherefores of why it's not there, but it's not there. Um, and uh, but we're going to put it there, and that will enable us to have the uh, assessment framework that enables us to judge and enables, and enables others to judge the effectiveness of the government and its partners in closing the attainment gap. So I, I, I readily acknowledge that uh, the information does not exist uh, at this moment, but the government is putting it in place. And what we will do with the national, the report that we publish on the national improvement framework um, is our best effort at creating a starting point in the absence of that comprehensive data. And does that, thank you, and does that mean um, testing results, standardised testing results from P1, P4, P7 and S3 as you were describing in the chamber yesterday? Yes. And when will those be first be available? Because in, the, in page 20 of, your, of the, of the uh, delivery plan it says we will publish performance information on a school by school basis but it doesn't say by when. Um, yeah, the, 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 that data, um, we've put the, um, the, the proposition on standardised assessment um, out to um, tender on the 20th of June. The responses to the invitation to, to tender are due by the 21st of July, and we would expect to see the first um, uh, material to be available during the school year 2017-18. Okay, so do, how does that impact on the on your point in the uh, performance information that's going to be available as to when school by school basis analysis will be available, which which is obviously in the delivery plan? Uh, Maybe seventeen eighteen. Seventeen eighteen. Yes, that'll be the first first. Yeah. It'll be available. But, but I would but I would but, but what I would also want to say to the committee is that we will be producing information um, in, in the form of a report on the national improvement framework which will be gathering as much data as we possibly can do based on the existing information to try to inform the debate so that we're not waiting until 2017-18 before we try to um, focus the efforts uh, that are required to and, tackle and would this you, issue. I appreciate that. And would you be able to maybe write to the committee just saying what are the what you'd expect the... Uh, uh, the gap, um, how do I best describe it, how we best judge the gap. I mean, is it uh, a test of P1, P3, P7 and S4 and S3, uh, but it's also the point you made earlier on to Joanne Lamont about um, national qualifications, which are by definition easier to assess because we have those figures now. Well, we have those figures. We, we, we do have those figures, and, and I'm certainly um, very happy to put together uh, some information for the committee. I suspect quite a bit of it is probably contained within what we've already said on the national improvement framework, but I'll... I'll, I'll I just think it's important it. to absolutely define what we're talking about, yes, otherwise I, I don't know yeah, how no, any of us no. understand yeah. what's, uh, what's uh, uh, going on. Uh, can I just ask, you also said to Liz Smith that there'd be, uh, there's no comparable data, or there's some comparable data, but not 32 local authorities, why comparable data? 
is it not, how are you not going to make sure that there's going to be a greater requirement on teachers to produce more data here? Because we'll be, re we'll be essentially replacing um, measurement activity that teachers are also undertaking in relation to the point on national, stan national standardised assessment. But in the rest of the delivery plan yesterday, um, I set out a whole variety of different measures to reduce teacher workload by what I hope to be a significant amount. And, you know, I've been stunned mm. is the only word I can describe mm. by the level of bureaucracy, assessment, just transactional uh, activity that is required by teachers right mm. across the system. Yeah. And I've been spending a lot of time getting my head around that and understanding it. And that's why the delivery plan is so heavy on the measures that I'm requiring of the SQA, of Education Scotland, why I'm putting Her Majesty's inspectors into the, the education authorities in August for a two week, every inspector in the country is going into ed, local authorities in August to identify which parts of the reducing the workload and reducing the bureaucracy working group conclusions have not been implemented and then I will pursue those mm. to get them implemented because they were supposed to be implemented and they're clearly not. So the inspectors are going in to do that work and so there's a whole programme of different mm. interventions to reduce that bureaucracy so that we can do what I said in Parliament yesterday, which is liberate teachers to actually teach. But, uh, yeah, but you'd expect, and you'd probably <coughs> uh, appreciate as a parent as much as we all would, that if the focus of government becomes those standardised testings in P1, P4, P7 and S3, teachers quite understandably are going to be completely focused on teaching to those tests, aren't they? It's just the same as a health target, it's just the same as other targets we, we have as government and as parliaments, which we are terribly good at laying on professional people. You know as a parent, as well as I do, John, that that's the reality of it. If that becomes the government's focus, that's where teachers are going to concentrate. Well, but the crucial point here is that the national standardised assessment is informing teacher judgment. So ultimately, teacher judgment is what will be, um, you know, will be collected. Sure. So, and that's consistent with the principles of broad general education so that we can ensure that young people are able to um, uh, experience that broad general education and to be assessed uh, on the basis of teacher judgment informed by uh, uh, standardised assessments of exactly um, the, uh, the performance that's being achieved. And I think it's important that the issues that Joanne Lamont raised with me mm. about um, the finer detail of that, mm, what, is, you know, mm. what, what uh, different ages, uh, different, uh, different backgrounds, the extent to which that is clear, um, uh, you know, that will be very much at the heart of the approach mm. that we take. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. <coughs> thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, first of all, uh, uh, can I just start by saying that I think that um, the focus that this plan uh, delivers is, is useful. I think the title, uh, you know, in a sense, sums up what I think we would all agree are the, are the twin priorities. I think delivering excellence and equity, raising attainment in general, but also making sure that that attainment is, is, is fairly uh, distributed across society, I think is, is clearly a, a very good aim. And I think we've talked a lot about um, uh, measuring attainment this morning, and I think that's right. You need to be able to understand the, the, the size and nature of, of that gap. But then in order to close it, you do need to be able to take action, and that requires resource. So, I mean, I think that we, in broad terms, can welcome um, the attainment fund. Um, but I would just like to ask the, the, the Cabinet Secretary just in terms of, I understand that that, that will be um, resourced from the changes in council tax. Uh, obviously, the, 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 there will be a requirement for redistribution between local authority areas. Can I just ask Cabinet Secretary how he envisages that, that taking forward and what, what, what sort of steps have been taken towards putting a mechanism in place to allow those uh, uh, redistributions between local authority areas? Um, well, that work is... Um, is essentially under preparation and uh, will be taken forward um, as part of the, uh, the wider dialogue that uh, the, the, the government puts in place. Um, we um, intend this to take effect from 2017-18, so we have um, an amount of preparatory time to enable us to, uh, to reach that point. Um, the, 
the way in which we intend to deliver this funding will be essentially driven by the need to um, identify um, where there is a need um, within particular schools, so it will be um, it will be uh, directed towards um, tackling the um, the circumstances that um, arise out of the um, the existence and persistence of deprivation. So the the measure that we're using is entitlement to free school meals. Uh, and that will enable us to, to guide and to direct as effective as we can uh, the resources that have got to be deployed. Uh, for, forgive me, the second part of your answer I think is, is, is interesting. I would like to ask you some more, but I actually, given the time scale, you must have in mind at least the outline principles of how that mechanism for, for redistribution of those funds will take place. And I think there's, a, there's obviously a real concern here about autonomy of, uh, fiscal autonomy of, 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 of local government because at the moment that, those are, uh, that this fund is going to be raised through council tax. Now, in order to redistribute that from central government, you know, there must be some, some clawback mechanism. Are you proposing that, that the, the, there'll be withholding of central government grants? I mean, what, what, is, what is an outline in principle is that mechanism for redistributing mm -hmm. that additional uh, revenue from council tax? Well, that essentially will be the subject of discussion with local authorities, which we, you know, which I've set out in the uh, in the delivery plan, the approach that we will take in that respect. Um, I've had discussions already with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities on um, uh, the principles of the government's approach based on the manifesto that we fought the election upon, and um, I'll continue those discussions and. That, that, that's what's set out in the delivery plan, and obviously that will inform the decisions that we well, arrive at in relation to 2017-18. For, for the benefit of the committee, could you maybe outline the, those principles? Well the, the, well, the principles are set out in the, the document that um, the, the allocation will be based on the number of children in primary school and S1 to 3 in secondary school who meet the eligibility criteria for free school meals. That's the but, principle but forgive me, that, that of wasn't issue. my question. My question isn't about how it's allocated, it's actually how it's, how it's, how it's raised and redistributed. Uh, because obviously there's going to be a requirement to redistribute mm. between local authority areas because attainment, uh, the attainment gap isn't evenly distributed between local authority areas. I, I would like to ask how that's going to be done. And, well, and, that, that's, and, 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 and my answer to that question is that that will be done uh, as a consequence of discussions that I have with local government on this question, and that's that's work that uh, will take place over the summer. Okay. Now, so, so, and can I just follow up on that point about how it will be allocated? Um, and I think there's a, a direct um, implication in terms of your, your previous set of answers in terms of the, the standardised testing and the way that that data will be used. Now, in, in your previous answer, you were saying that that data is to be used by teachers. Now. If the, the allocation of this funding is going to be based on the standardised testing, clearly that data isn't going to reside you know, or, or remain within schools. It will be collected and used for, for, for the basis of that assessment of the allocation of this funding by central government. And so to Tavish Scott's point, surely there is that implication. Surely there is a real risk that you then have teachers uh, essentially teaching to the test um, rather than necessarily to broader broader outcomes because it, it there is there is a financial consequence um, I don't I don't really follow the logic of the question that mr. Johnson has raised with me because what, I, what I've said is that the distribution of the hundred million pounds will be determined by um, the numbers of children in primary school and the next one to three who meet the eligibility criteria for free school meals that will be the driver of the Correct. distribution of the resources. Um, the, the information that is gathered f on standardised assessment that then informs teacher judgment um, will give us you know, a very uh, clear sense of where the gaps in attainment actually are. And the purpose of all of this is, and I've been very clear about this in all that I've said, the purpose of all of this is not to um, point fingers at people. The mm. point of this is to improve and to deliver the attainment that, sh that, that, that young people are entitled to have a chance to achieve. So the 
collection of the information is designed to identify where we need to um, intervene, what me methods need to be taken forward to try to help and to improve attainment. So that's the purpose of the, uh, the reform. And um, that's why I, I, I don't share the concern that Mr Scott has raised, um, that because I, 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 don't, I don't meet anybody in Scottish education that is interested in anything other than improving performance and attainment of young people. Do you want me to close? Uh, could you just okay. finish up? A couple of very short supplementaries, very short. Was just for a clarification, you mentioned that free school meals would be the indicator. In primaries one to three, everybody has a free school meal. There'll be, um, there's an eligibility criteria that determines whether, you know, what, what is the, you know, there's an eligibility criteria, regardless of the fact that people get free school meals, there are eligibility criteria for free school meals. So it's meals. only those that are eligible in, in, the, in the old sense? Well, well I, think, I think what, um, it's about identifying in a school if, the, if free school meals did not exist, mm -hmm. who would be eligible? If the, 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 the kind of blanket availability didn't exist, how many children would be eligible for free school meals will then drive what resources go into that particular school out of the £100 million? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Very, I mean, just on Daniel Johnson's question, it, but if, if you plan, as, as you do, as, as reported in the Herald today, to move the legal responsibility for education from local authorities to schools, then Daniel Johnson's question is correct, because teachers will there be, therefore face the legal, direct legal responsibility, depending on how that's all crafted, the direct legal responsibility for the very attainment gap measures that you're putting in place for S1, S3, yes, sorry, P1, P3, P5, and so on and so forth. Well, I think the, um, if I... Um, the, if I read the document, um, uh, let me just get my reference point absolutely correctly. Um, the issue is not about transferring the legal responsibilities for education from local authorities to schools. It is about bringing schools into the legal responsibility. So it's about ensuring that both local authorities and schools carry the legal responsibility in relation to education. And that is for completeness, to ensure that there is, um, there is the necessary statutory focus on ensuring that we are all focused on this particular objective. Quite understand that, but it, it, would it be fair to say that schools will now, or in the future, at some point later this year, have a legal responsibility for the education of children that they do not currently have? It, they, they will have that once Parliament has agreed to the sure, education absolutely. bill. Absolutely, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Dick, can we have Ross on, please? Thanks, Amir. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, following on from Fulton McGregor's point about looking at specific groups of young people, I'd like to uh, look at young people with additional support needs uh, for a moment. I was wondering if you could build on what you'd uh, spoken about yesterday to address the attainment gap specifically for young people with additional support needs. And I'd like uh, to ask specifically about the provision of dedicated staff capacity. Fundamentally, this is, is, is an issue for um, individual local authorities in relation to the deployment of staff within, uh, their, uh, within the, the education service. Um, so there will be examples around the country, and obviously I'm receiving correspondence in different parts of the country where some of this provision is changing and being reduced, and members of the public are understandably concerned about that, and I acknowledge that. Um, but fundamentally, that d those decisions rest with local authorities to, 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 to make judgments on those points. What the government's approach is designed to do, and this is actually an approach which is very much supported by local authorities, is to pursue an agenda where we put in place the mechanisms and the support that is appropriate to each individual person, which was the substance of my answer to Mr Greer in Parliament yesterday. Um, so I think it's, it's very important that we work to ensure that young people have the resources that are appropriate to their needs and obviously there's certain um, aspects of statute which will be very that, that clearly require that once a, um, a, 
A provision has been made in, in, in relation to the additional support for learning legislation, which um, puts um, what essentially structures the entitlement that a young person would have if they had additional support needs, um, and, and that they have to be fulfilled and deployed um, uh, as appropriately within the education system. So I think that the, the, the best I can do in answering Mr Gear's question is to say that uh, the, the, the policy framework that we operate within of getting it right for every child um, means that those with additional support needs should um, have those needs res uh, reflected in the design of uh, support that is made available for them. Thanks very much. We'll move on. Joanne, you've got okay. like um, Thank you very much. Can I just to go back a moment on this question of responsibilities being devolved to schools and education effectively being distanced from local authorities? Are you saying that schools don't have this extra responsibility with resources coming from an increase in council tax, not an increase in resources from the Scottish Government? Well, obviously, the, the, we have a specific commitment to additional resources that will come from the uh, changes that the Government proposes to make in the council tax, uh, which were part of our election manifesto. There will be wider decisions to be taken as part of the spending review about the allocation of resources to um, right across the board in, in, in public services in Scotland um, and obviously the government will make uh, its decisions in that respect uh, as part of the budget process. It would be fair to say that your specific commitment on closing the attainment gap is to be resourced through a mechanism by raising more council tax from within local authorities rather than saying this is a priority will then be reflected in the Scottish budget. Because um, if it is a priority, no, no. I would have thought it would be the centre of your budget, not no, some, frankly, what feels like a very odd mechanism to raise funding for something no, that not no. only you're saying is core, it's core business, but it's to be funded by local government at the very point at which local government is to have less influence over what's happening in, in education at a local level. Well, let, 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 me, let me just read what the document says yesterday. Um, on page 11 it says, currently legal responsibilities for delivering education and raising standards in our schools sit largely with education authorities, not with the schools and teachers that teach our children and young people every day. We will address this imbalance by extending to individual schools responsibilities that currently sit with local authorities. So it doesn't say taking away from local authorities and giving to schools, it says extending. So it's bringing schools into the legislative responsibility for delivering education. So, so it's you're not proposing to take education out of local authority responsibility? That's, you know, that's, you know, the, the paragraph is, is very clear. That it's about okay. extending the legal responsibility to schools, not about removing it from local authorities. Now, the, the second point is in relation to um, financial provision. And, of course, the, um, the issues around... Um, attainment will feature in the government's budget but the council you know, we set out in our manifesto a very specific mechanism by which we would raise additional resources to invest in attainment within schools and that was by the changes that we proposed to make to the council tax and that's what we're fulfilling as part of the delivery plan. Except it's in your manifesto, but I think it's still reasonable. We can also test it as a, an effective mechanism for funding our schools. I mean, I think can we can still be transparent to that. I suppose more specifically, the questions, I was interested in reading your um, opening statement that you provided to the committee. What, I suppose, at one level surprised me was the emphasis on teachers within education now. As an ex-school teacher myself, I understand their role and their importance. But if you're going to be talking about the attainment gap, do you recognise that it's actually a broader school community that will support some young people? Because some young people arrive at school, book in front of them, teach in front of them, and they will thrive. There are other young people that that is more difficult. And I wonder what assessment you've made of the level of support within schools, whether it's behaviour support, educational new learning support, um, admin support, home links, teachers, the kinds of provision that support young people to come into school when there's not necessarily somebody pushing them towards school. And do you recognise the importance of that support community in closing the attainment gap? I, I completely accept that point. Um, and I've seen um, some very good examples where schools individually are deciding 
Um, and this is why the whole issue of empowerment of schools and resources directed to schools is important. Because ultimately these decisions will be taken. You know, I've been to some schools where decisions have been taken that for some young people when they arrive, the most important thing they do when they come in the building is to get the toaster on. And so, and, and teachers are, teachers, the school community, um, you know, members of staff, um, admin staff, um, home link workers are all doing these sort of things because they recognise the impediment to learning is maybe this child is hungry. I've seen other examples about um, where some very inventive work has been undertaken about um, a procurement of school uniforms so that young people who just can't, you know, can't afford it or don't turn up with it are being equipped so that they're just you know, on a par with all the other uh, children's schools. Fundamentally, that's about um, the school community being empowered to meet the needs of those children in that locality, which is why we're putting the emphasis on, on schools. I've also seen, and I, I, I recognise I've seen some very interesting work about the degree to which uh, uh, people from other disciplines, for example, speech and language therapy, are integral to addressing some of the vocabulary gap that exists for children when they present at P1. And some of the models that have been de developed of how speech and language therapists are working alongside teachers are very inventive and successful in closing that gap. One point I would make is it's good works in places that are fantastic, and I've seen it myself in, in both in, as an elected member and as, an, as an, a, a teacher. But the point is that when budgets are being decided, there is anecdotal evidence, at least, that what we're seeing in our schools is a stripping out of these supports because they have to meet the statutory responsibilities, core business, as you focus on, on teachers. And when you do that, you lose, for example, the attendance officer who's monitoring attendance, which is very often an early signal of a problem of a child falling out of the system. And I wonder, would you be willing at least to commit to looking at this question? It's particularly important, and it will be raised by... Uh, families of young people with uh, additional support needs where they're seeing the personal support, the classroom assistant, these are the people that are disappearing out of the school with a particular impact on children who have got um, additional support needs. And, and what I would like you to commit with yourself to doing is at least looking at that because with there are pressure in budgets, these are the, the things that will disappear and will have a disproportionate effect on particular um, young people. And I think that that if we don't have that conversation about what's happening, the resources to our schools, I think we're compounding a problem for a lot of our young people. Yeah, I'm certainly very happy to look at that question and very happy to discuss it with the committee on an ongoing basis. And the last point, I wonder if I, I'm interested in some of the models for solutions, which standardised testing, um, diluting at least the role of local authorities in, in school education. I wonder if you have looked at good practice in local authorities in Scotland. I mean, I was fortunate to work in Strathclyde many years ago where there was a very radical approach taken. And I wonder if you've looked at what's happening currently within our local authorities to actually address these questions. Yes, uh, but, but, I'm, but I've not completed that exercise. And in a sense, the, the work that, again, the delivery plan sets out about the governance review is designed to do all of that. Because I think uh, John Lamont um, raises a, a very interesting comparison about the... Uh, capability of Strathclyde Regional Council in educational policy development. And I think, you know, as I, I, I would very much accept that um, the regional councils had um, really very strong um, capability in the development of educational policy and capacity. Um, now, that's now spread across 32 local authorities and one of the points I'm interested in, I made this point yesterday in my statement, was about local clusters. Um, there is in the north of Scotland um, a, a grouping called the Northern Alliance, which are a number of local authorities, um, City of Aberdeen, Aberdeen Shire, Murray, Highland, Western Isles, Orkney and Shetland, who are coming together voluntarily to share good practice. I was at one of their sessions a couple of Mondays ago in Aberdeen. It was a very, very substantial, thoughtful, challenging occasion with good input, and it was obviously informing the development of educational policy and thinking 
in all of these different localities. So I'm interested in exploring how we can ensure that we, um, we, can, we, we can be confident that we've got all the capacity and capability that we require to, uh, to, to guide this effort at local level within Scotland. Ross, you wanted to come in with supplementary. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, Convener. It was just to follow on uh, Joanne Lamont's point around about resources and um, provision. I, I don't know if the Cabinet Secretary may be aware, but there is, like, for example, reports in today's um, Press and Journal um, where actually a, a leading sort of educational expert says we could risk a, a lost generation um, due to cuts in classroom assistance um, in particular, um, with the figures in Aberdeen actually falling from 191 in 2007 to, to 115 now. Um, so it would be the Cabinet Secretary, what provision you know he, he would be making to increase the number of qualified nursery teachers as well as um, reversing the decline in classroom assistance because as you know both are absolutely crucial and um, particularly for our, for our most vulnerable children. Well I, I haven't seen the report to which Mr Thompson refers but uh, I'll, I'll certainly look at that in the course of the day. Um, let me start off with a general point about budgets and uh, and uh, and uh, um, I'm afraid it's Mr. Thompson that's, that's raised it with me, so uh, I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll give Mr. Thompson my very direct response. You know, we've got to live within the resources that are available to us that, are, uh, that we decide to put in place. Uh, a large measure of those are determined by the decisions of the United Kingdom government on finance. So when a Conservative government does to our public finances what the Conservative government has done over the last five years, I just courteously put it to Mr. Thompson. It's a little bit rich to um, to press me on um, the availability of public finances, but uh, I've said it the once. I might not have to. Uh, I'll try not to. I'll try not to return to it every time Mr. Thompson uh, asks me a question. But I can't promise to be as well behaved as that in the future. <laughs> um, so th there is an issue about resources, and I accept that. And we have to make. You know, we can't spend the same money twice. And uh, I'm beginning to sound like I used to sound when I was the old finance minister in this place. But it's uh, old habits, Mr. Scott. Die hard. <laughs> um, so. Having said all of that, there is, however, and this is the serious point that John Lamont raised, with me, that there is a there is a mix that has to be in place in uh, in a, a mix of, of 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 skills and talents that have to be within uh, the education system. Uh, I certainly acknowledge within the early years, and again, the delivery plan makes this point: the importance of um, um, of, of educational capability in early years education because again the earlier we can if young people are presenting even at nursery at two with a vocabulary gap mm -hmm. even at two then the more we have capable intervention at that time to try to address that the better mm -hmm. even if it's happening at two uh, and because the earlier we can nip this in the bud mm -hmm the better. So I accept in principle the point that Mr Thompson makes about the importance of that skilled capability to be available at um, all stages of the educational journey, um, but I, I, I simply put on record the fact that uh, yeah, there will always be challenges around resources. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think what we'll do is we'll move on to a, a couple of questions around about local authorities. Liz, would you like... Oh. Thank, thank you. Um, I wonder if Cabinet Secretary can uh, ask you about this clusters uh, model, uh, specifically um, what it is that you're uh, likely to propose in terms of, you've, you've expanded on the idea that you would like to increase autonomy for uh, head teachers, but at the same time to have uh, regional control, but that might provide a cluster model. I wonder if you could say something about that. But the second thing is, if we were going to be really radical in an age where uh, schools and colleges and universities are becoming much more integrated in the, in the general pattern of educational development. Would you foresee a clusters model that might include uh, colleges and universities in a local community as well? Because um, we'll be talking about a widening access to gender. Uh, that might have some interesting uh, repercussions for uh, furthering that widened access if the school community felt that there was a college and a university that was close on the same sort of uh, ambitions that they had. We, could you expand on this cluster model? The cluster model uh, concept is designed to 
we'll, we'll open up a debate about what's the, the, the most effective way of us um, ensuring that we deliver education policy effectively um, at local level. And um, I cited in my answer to John Lamont a moment ago one of the examples of the education clusters, which is a gathering of local authorities that shares good practice and works collaboratively together and is actually working on some of the thinking around, um, for example, the challenge of um, teacher recruitment in different parts of the country. Uh, I think I certainly am very open to a greater collaboration and cooperation between schools, colleges and universities. Um, I think one of the areas of great success in the reform agenda is the progress that's been made on the developing Scotland's young workforce. Um, it's perhaps for me one of the best examples of, um, well it, it is the advantage of the original concept and report was very, very clearly written. It's one of the most clearly written things I've ever seen in my puff. Um, and as a consequence of that, it's given good and clear thinking at local level and it's now been implemented probably the fastest I have seen anything being implemented as well, simply because of its clarity. And what that's enabling is um, young people's needs to be met most effectively because again, and you know, I, I, I think that the danger of, of, of the type of approach that, um, that, that I take of being out and about and listening to what's going on within the school community and the, uh, the wider community is that you, you hear a whole range of different anecdotes, but I'm hearing very good examples of young people who might have um, not fulfilled their potential in school right. being identified much earlier in the school journey as being somebody who would benefit from vocational education and good college partnerships are working with these young people and before we know it, the young people are in a different learning environment but they're prospering. It's a learning environment that suits them, suits their needs and they're prospering. So can I just add that the, the clusters would be a, a, a sort of reaction to a demand within a local community rather than being seen as a model that's good and transplanted into education generally. I mean, this is something that's going to be responsive to the local demand and to parents' wishes and to schools' wishes, or is it something that you're looking at uh, right across the board? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a subject that's very much open for discussion as part of the governance review, and um, I appreciate the committee will want early clarity from me on, on all questions. I quite understand that, but it's one that uh, I intend to discuss widely because there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of uh, different viewpoints that will have to be taken into account as to how this develops. But I think some of the points that uh, Joanne Lamont raised with me about um, her own experience um, in the environment that uh, she operated in Strathclyde Regional Council um, uh, is not lost on me in terms of the way in which um, cooperation across a wider area with more um, experience and, and resources available can uh, be deployed very effectively. And I've got to think also about how that can work uh, in harmony with the work of Education Scotland, which is the, the principal organisation that the, you know, on the government's behalf that's working to improve attainment and performance in schools. Okay, thank you. Daniel? Uh, so my question really follows on from, from sort of Liz Smith's line of inquiry. I mean, I think we recognise that, 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 that we need to review kind of how we you know, run our schools, how we resource our schools, and I think that's pivotal in terms of improving attainment um, and so on. But I think you, you are raising a number of questions. I think we, there is already we've discussed that the, you know, where responsibility for standards lies between local authorities and schools. I think the, the, the role of the clusters, and, and, second, or, and finally, obviously, there's the, the role for central government for actually setting those standards in the first place. And I, I recognise this is, this is work in progress, but could the Cabinet Secretary just, in, in broad terms, outline what, what he understands, the sort of different roles and responsibilities between that, that sort of network of four players of, of the school, local authority, regional cluster, and central government, both in terms of setting those standards, reviewing them, and, and resourcing well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolutely fascinating question because it's... <laughs> how, long, how, how long do you have, convener? Um, I, mean, what, I mean, just what's... Well, we, we could be... Um, the visit of the President of the Republic of Ireland might be delayed as I <laughs> work my way through I, this answer. I, I, um, <laughs> the, um, it, 
It's, it's actually a question I'm, I'm wrestling with a great deal in my own thinking. And, and, and Liz Smith um, uh, asked me a question last night, actually, in the education statement, in which I shared some of this dilemma. Because there is a... Um, and, and I don't in any way wish to personalise this, but Liz Smith is an advocate of schools having more and more um, autonomy to decide what they want to do. Yeah. But then ask me a question in Parliament, essentially saying, "Why don't you just tell them what to do?" So, and I don't, I'm, I'm not, but um, well, it kind of felt a bit like that last night. Um, but the, but I, I'm simply setting out that there is a dilemma between how much do I prescribe and how much do I leave to teacher judgment and to school judgment, and that's a, and that's a, and that's a very real debate that I'm having on a host host of issues. There's a lot of stuff in the delivery plan that I announced last night, which is really quite directional from me. Yes. Cut this workload, cut that bureaucracy, send in the inspectors. There's quite a lot of that. Now, that's because I need to move the system to quickly to tackle some of these issues so that I can liberate teachers to teach so they can focus on closing the attainment gap. So in that respect, I'm taking quite a series of directional steps. But I will never, ever, ever be able to make the judgment better in St Andrew's house about what a child in, let me just get my geography right, South Morningside Primary School um, <laughs> will, will need than the teachers, in South, the teachers and staff in South Morningside Primary School. Yeah. So uh, th th there, is a, there is a tension there, there's a dilemma. But what, I'm, what I want to be clear about is I want to have the whole system focused on closing the attainment gap, on improving attainment within our schools with as, with as few impediments as possible in the way. So there are some, So when I chew over my mind the question of what are some of the impediments in the way, then having a local authority asking a school to do something, well we'll start, we'll start at the, right at the coal face, a teacher been asked by a head teacher to produce material to satisfy the head teacher that he or she can satisfy the education authority, who the education authority can then satisfy Education Scotland, and the Education Scotland can then satisfy me, suggests to me that we've got multiple levels of bureaucratic mm -hmm. burden on individuals. When ultimately, what we all want is to make sure that the child is able to get the educational experience that will enable them to fulfill their potential. Now that is, frankly, the $64 million question, which then has to be addressed to answer the question that Mr Johnson fairly asks me about, well, where does the balance of it all lie between school, local authority, regional cluster, Scottish Government? And you know, to, to, to be complete, Mr Johnson, you missed out Education Scotland and the SQA. Well, um, well thank you for correcting So it's, it's just it's there for completeness. Um, and I think as a country we have to look pretty hard at how that operates. So, so, so I, mean, I, mean, let, let, I mean, let me be blunt. I mean, I think there is a fear in all of this that we somehow almost knee-jerk to the assumption that, that there is no value add from local authorities from that, that layer. And I think that there is a, there is a, a subtext, the discussion that's going on. And I, and I think that's something that I would guard against from, 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 from two perspectives. I think one is that I think that the, there is that, that local perspective, that, that, that the perspective over a local authority area and in terms of balancing and reflecting that, I think local authorities can bring. But also there's the element of, of accountability. And I think that moving things to local clusters, there, and I think we've seen it in some of the other changes where you, because there isn't a direct accountability to one body, that it's sort of, uh, you know, uh, there's some sort of uh, portfolioized or, 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 or amalgamated um, accountability that you, you lose that. And I think, you know, I think in some ways uh, I would ask the, the First Minister to really respond to Ra Larry Flanagan's comments uh, la that he issued last night. So if there is any suggestion of centralising control of schools and reducing the role of dem democratically elected local authorities in running education, that would be an issue of huge concern for the teaching profession. Now, I, I guess my question is, what would the Cabinet Secretary's response be to Larry Flan Flan Flanagan to that point? Well, I well, my response would be that we're, we're involved in a discussion about this point. And, and the one point I want to make clear is that um, I, I, don't, um, I don't have a, 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 a model or a blueprint of what this um, is going to look like. I, I'm, I'm simply a fairly raising, I think, 
uh, a lot of clutter in the system, which I think we need to get some clarity over. And the question that we have to answer is the one that Mr Johnson poses, which is where is value best added and how is value best added? And that might be the best way to address this question mm -hmm. because ultimately um, the child cannot have a, a chance of fulfilling their potential without good educational input in the environment in which they are directly being educated. So the question then, that, that, that's, you know, that's the first point yeah. at which value gets added. So the question then is, well, what, where else does value get added? And, and that's essentially what the governance review will explore. And I go into that uh, with a willing spirit to work with others to identify, and, and, and the committee. And the, you know, I, I think because these are, these are issues which you know, members here are representing different geographies of the country, different backgrounds, there's some uh, 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 well-experienced individuals in the field of education around the table. I, you know, I'm very open to input from the committee on how we take forward this discussion. Thank you very much, Convener. Just on the theme of that um, very reasonable discussion, um, and it's probably a totally unfair question, but how many N5s should uh, pupils at S4 be sitting? Because that's you seem to have encapsulated neatly, and that for me is one of the fundamentals. Should you be set, setting how many? Should, well, well, well uh, I, I wonder if Mr. Scott would forgive me by, 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 by asking the question back. By yeah. asking the question back, <laughs> it's because because I think. You see, if I if I give the um, I had a, a, a discussion on this very point with my officials last night, um, because ultimately, teacher judgment in individual schools will determine um, what will be the 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 um, what will be the best approach to presentation. For those young, for the, for every young person involved. So a young person, um, if we work back from what a young person might leave school with, let's say a young person leaves school with five hires. Working back from that point, the theory of broad general education would say that young person is not disadvantaged in any way if they sit f six nat fives as opposed to eight nat fives because ultimately they've come away with their five hires. And what they will have experienced at six nat fives will be a broad general education. And that's what the theory would say. Mm. Uh, I do accept, however, that, in, you know, that, 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 that doesn't create all the reassurance to pupils, parents and some teachers mm. that the right judgment has been arrived at. No, I suppose it's a, it's a, you know, it's a very fair question to ask me, and it also comes fits into the bill. Should I, you know, should I be saying, yeah. well, it should be X? But, you know, in weighing that question up, and I'm, you know, I, I, you have to explore um, what what would be the implications of me doing that on the confidence of teacher judgment. And one of the things that I'm really anxious to ensure that I don't do don't do in any respect, is undermine teacher judgment. That's fair. Uh, so are you open, Cabinet Secretary, to that discussion about that choice? Because I think it's pretty fundamental for everyone in schools, never mind for parents and pupils. I, I, I'm, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm coming into this job with an open mind, uh, yeah. and I'm very happy to explore yeah. these questions. Um, I think, but what I don't want people to go away with is, is a sense that uh, I'm leaping to a judgment about that That's point fine. because I think um, having tested the arguments just last night about this whole question, uh, I certainly thought that you know I, I, I heard a, a very clear rational explanation as to why a school would be perfectly within its rights to say six nat fives would be appropriate for candidates who were then proceeding on to take hires at a later stage and, sure and, there, would be, that, sorry, yeah, and sorry. there would be no and there would be no um, damage or loss of potential for the young people that would be affected in that yeah. way but but i'm sure part of that very rational discussion was that six does by definition limit to, to those six what that is 
six goes into five, yeah, he, does, he or she does five hires, but if it's not eight, there's by definition less choice. And that's the, at least something that has to be very carefully thought about when we're so struggling for stem cell, stem cell, stem, <laughs> uh, stem uh, yes. subjects and, and languages and so on and so forth. And, 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 and in a sense, the, 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 the answer which is underpinned, the answer to that point which is underpinned by the thinking around curriculum for excellence is that young people will have benefited from a broad general education yeah, to a more, to, to, a, yeah. to a greater extent in their educational journey than would have been the case when, I, well, I think, I think, I think when uh, yeah. Mr. Scott and I were wandering our way through all grades and hires in the, in, in what my son calls the olden days. Indeed, in my case, badly. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, Cabinet Secretary, following some of the concerns highlighted by the EIS Teaching Union uh, and indeed by my colleague uh, Daniel Johnson, uh, how will you ensure that national agencies such as Education Scotland and the SQA work with local authorities to ensure that there is a consistency in terms of the messages that are going to the teaching profession? Well, I think this, this is one area where I am prepared to be directional because I think it's, uh, it's too cluttered. And... Um, I think any reading of my, if, if, if people were to be saying of the delivery plan yesterday that I had, um, you know, started a whole process of going in with the tackety boots to attack bureaucracy and duplication and all the rest of it, then I wouldn't object to that headline at all, because that's what I'm doing. Um, I think there's too much duplication. Uh, I don't think there's sufficient alignment. Um, I think there's an awful lot of um, uh, of work that's been asked of people that really is not on the critical path to uh, sustaining the educational journey of young people. So, uh, and, and what am I going to do about that? Well, it's obviously, over the last few weeks, it's commanded a very significant amount of my time and attention to get us to the point where we were able to publish this yesterday. It's been my highest priority since I became the Education Secretary to give this firmness of direction just at the end of the school term, before the start of the new term in August, uh, which will enable schools to operate within a fashion. Because you know, if I if I if I put it this way, um, if, well, if I recount a conversation that I, I had with a, a head teacher from um, a primary school in Inverclyde, um, we were talking about the whole issue of uh, primary curriculum uh, congestion. I think is the delicate way I could put it. And this head teacher simply said to me, look, I've decided that um, I'm going to concentrate on literacy, numeracy and health and well-being. And whatever time we've got left, we'll do justice as much as we can to the rest of the stuff. I am not going to do it in eight equal parts in the curriculum. And I said to him, well, what, what, about, uh, what about when the inspectors turn up? And he said, oh, well, you know, we'll deal with that when they turn up. Well, that's <laughs> that. I need to take that feedback. And the, the Chief Inspector of Schools has heard that feedback from me. Our inspection approach has to respect the fact that that teacher, that head teacher, is making a judgment appropriate for the children in his locality who have who are probably presenting themselves to, 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 to presenting themselves to his school with a vocabulary deficit and numeracy issues. And if he doesn't get on top of those issues for those young people, then they'll never recover from them. And our inspection regime's got to respect that, and it will. And that's what the and that's what the inspection guidance from uh, uh, the chief inspector is all about. And that's about lining that's about lining up all the different elements so that teachers can take empowered decisions. Okay, right, thank you. Liz, you wanted to come in. Just one question, uh, Mr. Swinney, on the <coughs> question of subject choice. I entirely agree with you. It should be about the best interest of each child, and therefore you have to have flexibility within that subject choice. The question at the moment for many parents, however, is that some schools cannot provide that flexibility because they are constrained by the subjects that they are able to offer, sometimes because of teacher shortages, sometimes because uh, of a direction from a local authority that is insisting that they must have a certain number. That's the problem. It's not the fact that there can't be flexibility within individual schools. I think that's, that's part of the dilemma. And um, I think there, there are um, th there's some some real challenges there because obviously if a, if a school you know 
gets a direction from the local government, the local mm. authority which says you must do this, yep. then you know I quite understand the, the difficulty for the head teacher to say, well, we're going to do something different in this school. That's not a comfortable position to be in. Um, so you know that, that's why I, you know, I'm very happy to engage in, in discussion about this, this this particular question. There are of course other models on yep. the issue about tackling teacher shortages and. Liz Smith um, takes a particular interest in the, um, uh, the, 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 the in the Perthshire area. I, I was at um, the awards ceremony for St John's Academy just the other week. They're an absolutely fabulous uh, school in my constituency. And I was talking to young people who at different stages do courses in other secondary schools in Perth City. Now, I appreciate Mr. Scott's constituency, the idea of a secondary school cluster is a, is, a, is a bold proposition, but in the city of Perth, they are, able, they, they are working in a fashion that allows certain subjects at certain levels to be available in school A, available to pupils in schools A, B, C, D. So that's some imagination and innovation to make it possible, and it also is very good in terms of the the experience for young people. Perth College. And Perth College. Was cool. Thanks, uh, convener. Does the Cabinet Secretary think that the move to the cluster approach is um, ultimately a, a, a small step, at least, in, in terms of bringing about real um, local democracy and decision-making um, at that level, if we take... And I will direct members uh, to the fact that I'm still currently a councillor in, in North Lancashire Council, but if we take uh, North Lancashire Council as an example, you're looking at a council there with 70 elected members due to increase bigger than the, the, the Welsh Assembly. Um, and if, well, if you're considering that, you know, you're, you're, I, I think I, I welcome the move uh, that local areas will be able to take a wee bit more responsibility. And do you think it's in that, that vein and that basis that I think there's been a political unity about over recent years about having a uh, more local democracy? I think the, 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 the question for me is, and what I'm going to try to do in, in my tenure as Education Secretary is to keep on asking my question, is this getting it right for every child? That's what I'm going to ask myself every time I'm taking a decision. Is this the right thing for children's education or for children's well-being? I'm just going to keep on asking myself that question all the time. And ultimately, um, making sure that the needs of children are met in the educational environment or in the well-being environment um, must drive our decision-making. And some of the points that uh, Mr McGregor makes about local decision-making and local flexibility, um, if that delivers what's right for the child, then why not? That's the point I'd make. OK, thank you. Joanne? Thanks very much, Convenient. Just on that point, is there a question, however, about local accountability, which is about, at the very local level, Low Strathclyde Regional Council is a big organisation and not always the most wonderful organisation to work for. It was, at its very root, a local councillor advocating for local communities and local schools and was able, therefore, to influence the decisions that are made. I mean, my concern is, if we are saying local accountability can be about local pressure, but not without direct political influence in terms of local accountability. I think there'll be a concern about that, but I'll leave that there. I suppose the other question, I really want to come back could to I, Could I just, just say something mm. on that? I, 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 I totally accept the point about local political accountability. And, and, and you know, that, that, um, that has to be, it's a central part of our education system, and it's, um, it's uh, you know, and, and that's where statutory responsibility lies, and it needs to be, uh, respected and reflected. And that's exactly why I'll take forward this discussion with our local authority partners. Um, because I think sometimes, I think we've got, you know, there's a danger that some local flexibility can be eroded by the need to follow a particular, and this is the, the, the point I've aired openly with the committee, the dilemma between, you know, between central direction, whether it's by me or by a local authority, versus meeting the needs and circumstances of individual schools. But ultimately, there needs to be political accountability for all of these questions. And on the question of accountability, you know, there is a lot of accountability for um, the education of young people as well within uh, the school environment mm -hmm. and uh, in, in I suppose in the other reasons. observation I would make, and I'm, I'm I'm not sure if you would agree with this, that I recognise the role of a head teacher as a leader 
but there is no doubt that in the past progress in education has been in, in challenging the teaching profession because it's a kind of comfort zone um, and actual round mainstreaming access to education for young people with disabilities was, and I'm, I think it was great that, that was, there was movement in that, but there's no doubt that, you know, that if you simply take a view, leave the school to do the best, always the best, there has to be some kind of safeguards in that. Yeah. And I want to specifically to ask you this question about qualifications. I understand exactly what you mean about six going into five, but I think there's a different attainment gap there is the young person who falls out of the system early for whatever reason. There's the other young person who may come from a background where there's a lot of deprivation, but they themselves are very motivated and very bright, but they go to a school which does not offer the same level of opportunity to a range of hires. I mean, I once, I did teach at one point where they were only offering four hires, in other schools would be offering five. And in a world where you're now competing at um, higher education level, not only have you got to have five hires, but you've got a sixth one, that's better. If you've got a good group of advanced hires, that's better still. If you can show, going back, that you've got X number of qualifications before that, the filtering out of young people, because education, inevitably, at higher education level, is being rationed, means that the, some of the attainment gap is, is about young people who have not been able to get the opportunity to access these um, qualifications and I hear what you say around sharing I mean we were doing this 20 years ago frankly that you could go and sit your higher English in, you know, in the area that I taught but it also meant that the young person who was already challenged was having to travel to access a class for another youngster in a better area better in the sense that the school offered a broader range they sat in a classroom and they learned so you were immediately making it slightly more difficult for that young senior, lots of young people rose to that challenge. But I wonder if you've looked at this question of that different kind of attainment gap, which is about not, no matter how you individually are able to achieve your potential, the actual opportunity we've got are more limited than in other parts. Now, it might be a rural question, it might be a, a question of um, deprivation, but I wonder if that's something you're looking at. Yeah. It, 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 yes, it is, and it's an entirely valid point, and it's also integral to the issues that we have to consider about widening access to higher and further education. Um, so, I, 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 and I think, I think the, the, the question that John Lamont raises is a, you know, it, 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 it just as it's a further um, illustration of the debate that has to be had as to whether <laughs> you know we do it on a prescribed basis or do we do it on a uh, on a flexible basis? And it, be, you, be, and, and you know, there is no. There is no absolutely perfect answer to that question. We have to we have to debate it and discuss it. And I'm very open to the, the, the views of colleagues on some of these questions because um, ultimately, to go back to my answer to Mr. McGregor a moment ago, um, if we want to get it right for every child, why should a young person coming from the background that Joanne Lambert has talked about? be in some way prohibited and prevented from realising their full potential because they happen to go to a school that has a more limited curriculum than a school that's got a broader curriculum. So and, that's, and there's an inequity in there that, in a sense, we, that, that we have to tackle. And, 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 and the, the preamble to John Lamont's question I thought was really very significant because what... what um, what that involved was the whole question of challenge to, well, John Lamont expressed it as challenge to head teachers to, 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 to do things differently. Um, that is, you know, that, that's an essential part of having a, a framework in place, which I, you know, I think we have with the National Improvement Framework, which is all about driving progress and achievement and improvements in attainment and improvement in outcomes for young people in, in Scottish education. So you would concede, or would you recognise that if you accept that picture I described, that some of this is simply about resources, that formula for staffing or whatever wouldn't recognise that the, the attainment gap that then comes from not having sufficient teachers across subjects? Because well, you know, I, I I've, seen, I've seen, for example, um, you no longer have a modern studies teacher, a geography teacher and a history teacher because rationally it doesn't make sense in terms of the numbers, but actually then means further on in this very bright child can't do both geography and history, geography and modern studies, whatever it might be. Would you recognise that it's actually a case for at least looking 
that how you direct resources in that kind of way to address the attainment gap too? Well, the first point I'd make is that I'm not, I'm not sure that all of these judgments are about resources. Not um, all of them, but some. some. Some may be, but I don't think, I wouldn't concede that all of them are about resources. Um, and the second thing I would say is that obviously, as we move towards a system where we are um, putting more resources directly into particular schools, driven by the um, criteria around uh, deprivation and disadvantage, um, there are then mechanisms in place in those schools to try to address these issues. Okay, th thanks very much for that, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm just going to move on to further education. Gillian's got a question on further education. Not and then further we're going education to wrap up. yet. And one of the things that um, I've been seeing, and I'm from the college background, and I've been speaking to College Scotland recently and, and various people from further education, is about the idea of having more flexibility in how they can use their funding. Um, and I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary's got any thoughts on that. I think the um, I think I'd need to see just a little bit more specifics from the college sector about what their aspirations were. Um, I certainly think that we um, you know, we've taken a number of um, uh, very clear decisions to uh, relate the uh, activities that are undertaken within colleges more directly to the world of work, and that's been a major part of government policy in the course of the last few years. And um, I, I, and I think we're, we're seeing the, the benefits of that in terms of the outcomes that are being achieved. Um, but I'm certainly very happy to consider um, the desire for flexibility um, in the use of funding by colleges with you know, some detail on the, mm -hmm. the points that they'd like to consider. One specific thing that uh, recently in my area in North East Scotland, um, we've got what I think is a very good example of good practice with North East Scotland College, which has footprints in schools. It's, for example, there's a learning centre in Ellen Academy that they have there, and they also have a very close relationship with Robert Gordon's University. Um, and the principal of the college described it to me as, I don't mind how it's used because it's public money across the board, and he was very much into using resources across schools, colleges, and sharing of resources. Has that been your experience when you've been speaking to, to other colleges throughout the country? It, in, 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 increasingly. I wouldn't say it's a complete journey, but I think that, that, that I'm very um, mindful of the learner journey. And if I go back to my uh, uh, some, some of what I've said earlier on, um, it may be for some young people that, are, if I take the Ellen Academy example, there'll be some young people whose educational outcomes are much improved by the fact that instead of going into this door, which is an Ellen Academy classroom to go into that door, which is a North East a Scotland college door, um, their needs are fulfilled much more effectively. And if that's the case, then I think we should, we should celebrate that. And that's, that, that type of closer working between schools and colleges is exactly the type, and there's a role for employers as well, uh, to be closer to all that thinking about developing Scotland's young workforce is integral to that process. So I'd, I'd, I'd be very open uh, to that type of proximity. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we're just going to draw it to a close here. We did say, we said in, in our pre-meeting that there was a great deal of ground to cover, and although you've been answering questions for an hour and 40 minutes, there still is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, we will obviously, in September, we'll be having other sessions, but I, I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much for answering the questions, and you've created lots of work for the committee. Thanks very much for that, Kevin. Thank you. Sessions, so could I ask non committee members to leave. Thank you.